Lucas is a died in the world systems neuroscientist. As a grad student, he studied vocal learning and songbirds with Michael Brainard. Um, he's also deeply interested in computational neuroscience, having taken both the methods in computational neuroscience class at Woods Hole and the brains, minds, and machines class in Woods Hole. And he's mostly a deep thinker. Um, as such, he wrote to both Josh and me, uh, proposing to do a joint postdoc on a project that would tackle what might be the most difficult or fundamental problem in the cognitive neuroscientist sciences to try to understand how real neurons in the brain together uh, can generate processes that we would, we would describe as symbolic um, at the level of the mind. And so he's actually spent half a year in, in Josh's lab studying um, human behavior in a drawing task that he then also trained successfully to monkeys in my lab. Uh, he's made amazing progress uh, on modeling human behavior, also modeling uh, monkey behavior. And this is all part of a CBMM uh, plus Xiao Jing Wang at NYU collaboration, uh, which has been amazing. And um, I am really excited to, to hear, um, well, to, to see you all here, um, what Lucas uh, will have to tell you about uh, his project. So thank you so much again for coming and, and thanks Lucas and please go ahead. Thank you very uh, for a very warm introduction uh, and generous introduction. Um, so I guess I want to preface this with a couple points. Just uh, first, you know, a lot of this is work in progress. And so any uh, thoughts, questions, um, critiques you might have, uh, I would definitely welcome that. And second point is uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the work I've done in the context of prior literature and in terms of its implications for what I think about uh, the, the field uh, in, in general. And so a lot of the, the points I make are, are sort of um, points of similar discussion as opposed to very strong assertions about you know, the this, this state of knowledge. So that's also just, again, to stimulate discussion. So, um, <clears throat> so, so uh, a, a very important and critical aspect of the mind is compositionality. But this, I mean the capacity to generate meaningful, uh, generate uh, a new thoughts and behaviors that are meaningful, complex combinations of simple parts uh, to rapidly adapt to new problems. And uh, for example, uh, language is probably a, a very, um, the pinnacle of examples for, for, for compositionality. Uh, if I told you that two yellow hippos swam to the moon, you probably have never heard this before, but you could probably construct an image in your head very easily of what this might look like. And uh, what I wanna argue is that compositionality, uh, this, this example reflects two key features of compositionality. First, the idea that there are knowledge uh, consists of uh, at least in part, mental toolkit of, of symbol-like components. In this case, for example, understanding of the color yellow, what hippos are, um, um, the moon, and how to count, and an understanding of uh, syntax, so how to put words together into a larger meaningful phrases. A second point is that uh, compositionality uh, depends on the ability to construct new thoughts and solutions given any particular problem by recombining these components in, in, in meaningful ways. And of course, you can flip this around. It's not just for perception, but if you have this thought in your mind, you can uh, construct a new sentence to convey this idea to someone else. But compositionality is not just critical for language. The compositionality, as I defined it, I think is critical for many kinds of cognition, including action planning, logical reasoning, tool use, social cognition, various kinds of perception, many things that uh, you can describe as involving complex combinations of parts. For example, um, if I ask you to uh, learn to imitate this dance, and let's say you have some expertise in dancing. You might try to think about how this dance works in terms of some symbol-like components, like different discrete categories of moves, like A, B, C, and D. And in your head, come up with a way of manipulate these symbols, come up with a way to, to, to make this dance, and importantly, find a way to sort of ground these, uh, this abstract plan into a sequence of skilled movements. Moreover, uh, you're not limited just by you know, the data in front of you. If I said, uh, imagine your dog doing this dance, you, you could do that. If I said, imagine Michael Jackson doing this dance, uh, you could probably do that as well and incorporate some of the stylistic elements of how uh, Michael Jackson dances. So uh, how does compositionality work? And, and um, what I wanna argue is that, that, that we, we currently have a little understanding at the mechanistic level of how compositionality works. So there's been a lot of very important work on uh, compositionality, looking at behavior and cognition. And uh, there's some, been some key insights uh, into the kinds of cognitive algorithms uh, that might enable these kinds of behaviors. Uh, and, and one of the key insights is that uh, in many cases, we can uh, computationally model uh, co compositional behavior in the form of uh, uh, models that incorporate symbol 
incorporate knowledge in the form of sort of discrete abstract and symbolic elements, such as these uh, symbols for dance moves. Moreover, these models can then uh, manipulate these symbols uh, to do things like reason and plan. And this has been important uh, all the way from sort of classic work, uh, let's say looking at uh, planning models for, for, for playing chess to more recent uh, work that uh, melds probabilistic variations of these to, to capture the graded and, and quantitative variations in actual behavior and thought. But conspicuously missing is this link between the algorithms and neurons. So we, we don't really know how these, these sort of symbolic elements are, are really um, enabled by neural tissue. And uh, the, the key part of my talk is basically I want to argue that um, to understand mechanisms of compositionality, it'd be very useful to sort of bridge this gap in understanding. So uh, for, for a few reasons that I'll, that I'll list now. Uh, first is just, just a general curiosity in trying to understand how the mind works in terms of mechanisms. Um, but even if you're not necessarily interested in that, I, I think there are, other, there are other key reasons. First is that uh, the uh, symbolic models often struggle to capture the, the full complexity, creativity, and efficiency of uh, thought and behavior. And this indicates that there might be something really important about neural processing per se in how compositional, uh, natural compositionality works. For example, associative learning processes, pattern completion, uh, rapid parallel processing, and things like this. Right? And, and this idea has been uh, in, in argued for in part by, by a lot of people in, the, in, in sort of connections framework in, in cognitive science and, and has really been put into practical um, uh, application in, in a lot of sort of modern AI uh, based on neural network models. Uh, and this uh, idea of neural processing inherently being, uh, um, inherently being powerful is also a big part of modern neural symbolic models, such as models uh, pioneered by, by, by Josh, um, uh, where they, people try to meld uh, neurons and symbolic computations to, 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 to capture both sort of the uh, symbolic aspects and the, the, the neural process aspects of cognition. Um, so, so the, oh, sorry. So the point there is just uh, there might be neuron specific processes that are important. A second reason is that a lot of knowledge might um, the support for compositional behavior might actually be sub symbolic, um, and so this uh, or, or be better captured by sub symbolic processes. Uh, for example, um, language uh, is thought to not just be strictly compositional, but also involve things like context and pragmatics, um, such as um, the the environment, the state of an environment social cues, your emotional state, and things like this in terms of understanding what a sentence means. Uh, more generally, across different kinds of cognition, things like your emotional state, um, motor habits, uh, the state of the body, low-level perceptual features might all come into play in, in, in really natural forms of compositionality. And we might better model these, think, think of these as, as neural processes. Uh, and, and a third point, a simple point is just that we still don't really know what the nature is of symbols. And so while we, we, we have done a lot of interesting computational and behavioral experiments to, to validate our, uh, the symbols in our models, it would be great to have an additional, essentially, test data set of, of neural activity to validate what the symbols really are. So, so just to reiterate, uh, the four key, four key reasons. First is just curiosity, right? Understanding how nature works. Second is uh, there might be specific neural processes that support efficient symbol operations. Uh, third is that some knowledge uh, might be sub-symbolic and still cr critical for, for how compositionality works. And finally, it'll be great to have neural data as a test data set, essentially, to, to really further validate what we think, what symbols really are in the mind. So what I'm arguing for is a multi-level approach where we uh, essentially, in the same individual, the same system, study all these levels of analyses, let's say behavior, um, cognitive algorithms, and uh, neural processes, um, in order to try and come up with sort of a general framework that can explain all these levels of analyses in the same individual, let's say solving a compositional problem. Um, so uh, I would argue what's missing is, is an animal model that allows us to do this. An animal model is critical, I think, because uh, we want to be able to record neural activity at the time scale and resolution of thought and action, which um, currently we can only do with invasive, uh, invasive recordings, uh, and, and we can't really do with, with functional neuroimaging in humans. So what's missing, I would argue, in animal uh, models is um, really behaviors that emphasize compositional generalization. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is our efforts to develop such a paradigm in macaque monkeys um, and our efforts to study the compositional structures used by the monkeys and humans in the same paradigm. Um, so before I discuss that, I think it's, it's interesting to just briefly discuss what 
uh, what evidence is there for, for sort of compositionality in animals? Or is animal thought compositional? And uh, this is something that I, I'm sort of thinking about and, and reading about. Uh, and I think it's worth just putting down some ideas here. One is, uh, I think there's interesting work in ethology that you could argue really indicates interesting forms of compositionality. Uh, first is uh, tool construction. So animals for, from apes to, uh, to kinds of birds have been shown to use tools. And in some cases, actually, to put together simpler parts of tools to construct more complex tools, such as this orangutan putting together simple boxes into sort of a ladder to reach at this, um, this treat that he can't reach otherwise. And the critical idea here is that uh, it looks like this occurred through a moment of insight, as in he internally put these boxes together, as opposed to trial and error, putting two or three other boxes and, and sort of figuring it out eventually. Um, there's other examples of animals putting together, orangutans putting together sticks to make larger sticks that they can then use to reach for treats that are outside the cage. Again, in, in, with indication that this occurs through insight as opposed to just uh, rote trial and error. There's also some studies of, of vocalizations in, across different species, especially primates and birds, indicating that the sequences of vocalizations animals make in the wild can be explained as simple combinations of sort of vocal primitives, as, uh, such as these colored balls here. And that these different kinds of combinations can be uttered, seem to be uttered in different contexts, indicating they might mean different things. Now, now generally, it's, it doesn't seem like these meanings are compositions of the meanings of the particular primitives, but it seems at the very least what people call phonological composition, the ability to, to generate new complex behaviors by putting together parts. Uh, and, and of course, there's also related work in apes learning human sign language and, and things like that. Again, sort of simple kinds of combinations. And in, in, in primates are also highly uh, social animals, and it's thought that monkeys have a highly um, a complex, intuitive, highly complex and abstract understanding of, of social relations, such as um, A is the father of B, or uh, X is dominant to, to Z. And that they can use these abstract relations to very quickly recognize and understand relations between individual monkeys that they that they encounter. And so um, I argue that this this is an interesting indication of of compositional structures in the mind. Uh, a, a relevant for us is is the need to study something in the lab, or we can study apes in, in a neuroscience lab. So I, I also just want to point out some prior work that is indicative of uh, lab lab uh, sort of behavioral studies. Um, uh, reflecting some kinds of compositionality. And then I'll just point out a few examples that's not exhaustive, but for example, numerosity. So animals can count uh, to small numbers, such as one, two, three, four, and then reporting how many items there were. Uh, classic work on, uh, on cognitive maps, the ability to sort of internally put together, sort of let's say, uh, internally represent different routes and take shortcuts. Um, the ability to learn and memorize action sequences that are composed of individual elements. Most of this work is, is really about memorization or cued, cued sequences as opposed to really generating new sequences, but looks like you know, the substrates are there. Um, there's work on stimulus sequences. So uh, animals, different animals can recognize and discriminate different sequences of sounds, for instance, um, based on the combinations of components in those sounds, in this case, syllables for, for zebra finches. Or, or work by Vinrick here uh, and, and others arguing that in, in some cases, the representations of natural objects such as faces um, uh, can depend at least in part on representations of parts like neurons that encode the presence of uh, hair or no hair, for example. Um, and so I'd say all of this is, is really important work suggesting that, that humans are, are not unique in the sense of having some forms of uh, having compositional aspects in their mind. Um, I would argue, though, that what is really missing in, in these paradigms is, is the combination of the following two things. Uh, uh, behavioral tests that really uh, are um, behavior that reflects complex combinations of simpler parts and um, tests that really em emphasize generalization to new problems. And so um, we so, so we, we developed, we think, such a paradigm to, to, um, to, to, to that addresses these two uh, these two goals. Um, and um, so, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about that. So, um, so, so first, uh, I'll, uh, this paradigm is based uh, on drawing. So first, I'll, I'll describe why drawing as an interesting paradigm to study compositionality. 
Uh, second, I'll talk about studies that we did in humans to assess the capacity to, to first ask whether humans can very rapidly learn comp high order compositional structure and drawings and generalize that to draw new things. Um, and this is both sort of a, a development of this task as well as to, to ask interesting questions about cognition. Then we trans ask whether we can uh, get animals, get monkeys to, um, to also perform this drawing task. We found that they can. And moreover, we found that monkeys can generalize different kinds of compositional structure. Finally, I'll discuss implications for these behavioral findings, as well as ongoing work towards identifying neural mechanisms in this paradigm. So first, why is drawing an interesting paradigm to study compositionality? So imagine I gave you this owl and asked you to draw it. It's a pretty complex picture, but I think most of you, even if you have not much experience drawing, might sort of break it down into simple abstract parts that you can um, that, that, that looks like an owl. For instance, you can draw uh, two circles like this uh, and then sort of like eyes and whatever. You can maybe draw sort of an, a, a squiggly outline and then put to your tail and different parts. Um, or, or if you're Pablo Picasso, you might really decide it to arguably the simple elements of the, the body, this eyebrow nose thing and, and wings, right? And um, so, so if we want to speculate a bit as to the, the knowledge structures in, in, in Pablo Picasso's mind, uh, it seems like um, uh, there's reason to believe that at least part of it is first you know, the concept of an owl as, as consisting of different kinds of parts, as well as uh, different primitives for drawing. And these can be sort of perceptual or action-based primitives, but primitives are reflecting, let's say, simple shapes and actions, like lines and circles or dots, and rules or ways of combining these to make more complex shapes. And uh, drawing, uh, draw, drawing is 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 uh, is is interesting paradigm to study. Partly also because it's it's it has a long history in study in psychology, um, uh, supporting this idea that it really does reflect compositional compositional structures in the mind, uh, both at the level of perception, how to group things, how to uh, uh, how do we perceive parts of an object, and so on, as well as action. How do we construct hierarchies of simple actions uh, to, to make drawings? Um, and uh, there's another sort of practical point, which is that there's rich sensory uh, manipulations you can perform and stimuli, as well as rich motor data to study. Uh, and that finally, this doesn't involve language, so you can potentially study this in animals. Lucas? I, yeah. I, I mean, I, can I, I guess I have a high level question of, um, about, like, clearly, you, you, as you're, you're going to show us that you can study this in, in monkeys. I, but do monkeys ever? draw in the wild i mean i mean is this i guess my question is is this an ethologically relevant behavior yeah and that's an interesting point and, and something i'll get to in a bit um uh the question of whether mon I, I don't think there's any evidence of monkeys drawing in the wild um there's evidence of um apes um readily picking up pens and drawing on paper if you give it to them right but it doesn't seem like it reflects anything natural per se but i, I guess the question uh, one thing i'm wondering is whether it reflects a more any capacities for visual motor construction. So yeah. putting together parts in the world or seeing parts in the world, um, objects in the world is composed of parts. Um, right, so I mean, it, make, it makes sense from a tool construction perspective yeah. that, that it, it, I, guess, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering here is like, sh should we be thinking about this as a kind of um, uh, symbolic compositionality where you could draw a representation of something else, right? Or is it, should we think about it more like tool construction where the tool is not constructed as a representation of something else, you know, for example, for, for the purposes of communication? It seems like there's a critical difference between those two versions of compositionality. Maybe one way to, to frame it is, is if you have a monkey draw like a, an owl, is the monkey sort of saying, this is an owl, and I think an owl is composed of these parts, and I'll put them down to, to make, to, to you know, to represent an owl, or is it that they sort of learn uh, different sort of action strategies for, for drawing that thing that they don't necessarily think of it as parts of an owl? Well, I mean, that that's the, the latter possibility is hard to wrap my head around, right? Because why would they, what, what functionality would that have? Can, can I jump in for a second? I think this is a great question, but yeah. when you actually see the task that Lucas is studying, yeah. I, you know, it's an open question whether we want to say it's the same as drawing, like for humans. Um, I think it, it has 
the key components in terms of perception and action and key components of compositionality, but it's not necessarily representational or communicative in a way that human drawing is. So it's possible that what we might say, well, human drawing is a unique paradigm for compositionality in all sorts of ways. And what we're going to be doing in monkeys is only part of that, but it still might be one of our best ways to get at compositional perception and action planning. Um, I, and I think when you, when you look at the task that way, it's, it's it has as much to do with natural monkey behavior as most lab tasks, right? Um, which, you know, if you interpret them literally is not at all what the animals do, but I think, you know, there's many things that might involve, um, you know, foraging, collecting you know, things to eat, bugs, uh, whatever, grooming. There's lots of things that, things that monkeys will do in the, in the wild that sort of have the same kinds of uh, features under this abstract form. So. Thanks. Yeah, yeah that, that's how I feel as well. That I, I wouldn't say that they're representing objects or natural objects when they draw, but it, it's it's more like a paradigm to study sort of more more simple forms, non-representational forms of compositionality um, in, in action perception. Um, so I, yeah, so so we uh, we set out to to, to try to, to study. The, um, can we get basically have a, a paradigm where we can study? Uh, learning and generalization of, of compositional action strategies, um, partly to sort of develop this paradigm, but, uh, but partly also just to understand something about how humans um, learn and uh, learn and, and generalize. Uh, I, I'll not spend too much time on this because this is already published work, but uh, the general way this worked is that we had uh, different groups of subjects uh, drawing different kinds of um, images, and they drew these one by one. So this, 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 this. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can see my cursor. And uh, these uh, these images um, were similar across groups at a low level, consisting of you know just lines and circles, but they differed across these groups in this higher order structure. Group one subjects tended to have these sort of vertically structured objects that you might call skewers. Group one, group two subjects had sort of these horizontally oriented objects that you might call dumbbells or um, or barbells. And the, the key idea was that after drawing on the order of 10 to 20 of these, without any instruction as to what structure there is, or without any feedback as well, um, do people spontaneously um, internalize the structure and then use this to generalize when they ask to draw something different? So um, the, uh, if you, we found that indeed people internalize structure and, and generalize differently. So you can ask subjects to draw this stimulus after training. And this example, group one subject uh, drew this image uh, using sort of a skewer strategy. So starting from the left and putting down these sort of vertically oriented skewers, this group two subject drew uh, first the background <laughs> grading and then put on top of it these like, uh, the, I guess these lollipops you could call them. And so I, we think this is strong evidence at least that this little amount of training biased their representations or biased how they drew. And we want to understand better, uh, you know, what, what are the knowledge structures underlying this bias? So uh, broadly we used two approaches, one, sort of an experimental approach, basically testing patterns of generalization, the variety of stimuli that look like this, but also variety of stimuli that were a little bit different in that they were uh, rotated. And we also uh, uh, compared behavior to a computational model uh, with the uh, logic that if the computational model trained and tested on the same images, images as, the, as the humans can uh, capture some aspects of how humans generalize, then uh, some of the knowledge structures in, in, the, in the model might be approximations of the knowledge structures in human. So I won't go into detail, but the, these models were neurosymbolic models um, that had consisted of a sort of a symbolic generative model for drawing uh, combined with a neural network that uh, uh, processed images and assisted uh, inference or search in the space of potential drawing programs generated by this uh, symbolic model. And this model was initialized with uh, this model essentially had like simple drawing primitives like line, circle, and uh, transformations of these objects and uh, was equipped with a learning algorithm that allowed it to um, uh, discover uh, new sort of procedures that combine similar primitives in potentially abstract and complex ways. And, and so the outcome, the, the outcome of these analyses and experiments uh, indicated that these subjects had learned different kinds of structure that look something like this, where group one subjects had learned something like uh, like sort of abstract skewers, where uh, a skewer function can take in multiple primitives, P1, P2, P3, and put them down at different uh, vertical positions in a skewer, right? And so this can construct all sorts of kinds of skewers. Whereas uh, group two subjects um, look like they had um, 
they learned structure in the form of, let's say, four vertical lines to make gratings, as well as um, like lollipop, combining circles and lines to make lollipops or, or, or barbells and so on. Um, and so, uh, okay, so, so the, the, I think there are two key take homes from, from uh, this study. One is that I think it gives us an insight into um, learning and generalization. Um, so the fact that the, the subjects weren't explicitly instructed to learn near this, um, and they only had an order of 10 to 20 uh, examples or trials to train, suggests that they had some bias to rapidly learn abstract compositional procedures from drawing. And this is not necessarily a new idea. Uh, people have argued for the importance of abstraction in, in, uh, in generalization for a long time in cognitive science. But I think it's cool that we can, uh, we have sort of like a structured paradigm which is sort of study how this works. and. Um, Sorry, and uh, um, yeah. Uh, so, so a second uh, uh, key idea is, is looking at the, um, the knowledge structures in the computational model. So, um, one is that uh, it, the, the idea that there it implies that, um, and what this implies about maybe how uh, the human mind might work in this process. So, one it argues for importance of sort of bottom-up neural processes, um, supporting sort of fast inference uh, in, in planning. Second is the idea of sort of a, a perhaps slower symbolic generative model for uh, reasoning about uh, structured drawing programs. And the second, which I didn't describe at all yet, but it, the idea of motor efficiency being important, being important for deciding uh, what drawings to make. So uh, the, the best models are ones that incorporated some aspect, some cost related to the efficiency of action so that it would generate drawings that minimized costs related to, let's say, overall distance traveled and so on. So broadly for, for a lot of kinds of behaviors that involve actions, um, this argues that it's, it's not just, just about sort of symbol-like, symbol abstract symbol-like processes, but also how these actions are grounded in, in the real world that, that, that influence how we make decisions about these. Um, and another point is, is just that it sets up sort of an experimental computational framework for studying compositionality. Um, so and next we want to ask whether we can uh, generalize this, this approach to studying monkeys. Um, so, so before I discuss that, I think it's, it's just a brief foray into you know, part of the question Sam asked, but what evidence is there that it is drawing a natural thing that primates do? I mean, so no, it's not a natural thing that primates do, but I think um, it's interesting to, to look at, there's, there's a lot of interesting work on people just asking if you put uh, primates in the context where they can draw, like put them in front of paper with a pen or some ink, what do they do? And uh, it looks like at least uh, apes, like gorillas and chimps, have a propensity to, to make scribbles on a page, uh, such as this. And moreover, it's interesting that these are not necessarily just random scribbles, but um, it seems like they respect some um, spatial structure in terms of, let's say, the, the, the page. So uh, chimpanzees will often not draw out over the page, but draw within the page. If there's already some images on the page, they will uh, sort of draw in some way that is related to that, like symmetrically related to this image or sort of going with, within the bounds of this image. Um, you know, obviously these are cherry-picked, but um, it shows that they have some, maybe some propensity to, to care about the spatial or organization of things. Um, and if you just have them draw without these sorts of images on the page, they, even their scribbles seem to show maybe some sort of structure, like horizontal lines or sort of a fan shape. So I think this is partly, I, I, I wouldn't take too much out from, from this, but it's just, it, it just seems like, at the very least, maybe there's some basic sensory cognitive and motor abilities that drawing uh, taps into, uh, and that perhaps we can also tap into in a structured drawing task. Um, so, okay, so uh, in, in Virg's lab, uh, we've been um, training monkeys to draw, and we've successfully trained monkeys to draw in a manner that, that is uh, analogous to what we, uh, I showed you with the humans. So generally they draw on a touch screen uh, by tracing images on the screen. Um, and um, the, I won't go into much detail about how you take, how this initial training structure works for the entire task, like taking a naive monkey and training him. Uh, but at a high level involves um, a series of more and more complex drawing images, as well as um, uh, a reward-based um, reward based training. So uh, now we have monkeys that, that, can, that can do something like this. Here's an example of a monkey. Um, doing uh, a trial. So this is a top-down view of a monkey uh, in a cage. Um, he's facing a touch screen. This is on loop, so I'll just describe it. So the stimulus first shows here, he presses a button in the middle to initiate, initiate the trial. Um, the stimulus doesn't disappear, it, it fades out a bit. 
Uh, and he is then in a drawing phase where he can draw whatever he wants. He can use as many strokes as he wants, whatever shape strokes he wants. And when he thinks he's done, he presses the button in the bottom to report that he's done. And then he's scored by the computer, um, generally based on just accuracy of the image, right? So pixel level accuracy. Uh, but uh, I'll describe in other cases where we impose other kinds of uh, costs or, or, or scoring costs, but generally it's about accuracy. Um, and he receives um, uh, visual feedback and water indicating his, uh, his score. Um, so just to show the same thing, but in the schematic, there's a preparation phase, the animal presses go, and um, the animal has free to produce as many strokes as he wants in your drawing phase. And then he can press this, whenever he wants, he can press this green button to indicate that he's done. And then he's scored and reward is uh, proportional. Reward is a function of, of sort of the score. And again, I just wanna emphasize some things I think are quite cool about this task is that there are no explicit cues for what strategy to use. So what motor actions to use. And also there are no cues as to when you're done. So you can decide when, to, when he's done. So here I'm showing you a variety of different um, images and drawings by, by one monkey. So on the right, I'm showing you drawings represented with, um, uh, each stroke is represented with a ball at the um, onset of the stroke and the color indicates the ordinal position, the temporal order of each stroke. Um, I, I just wanna point out maybe a few interesting features. One is that uh, you, you have these complex, relatively complex stimuli like this that he, can, he breaks down into these sort of discrete line segments. At other times, he'll break down an image like this into you know, lines and circles as, as, as we might. Um, a lot of times there are stimuli that are quite similar um, image-wise, but he produces quite different uh, motor strategies like here and here. Uh, and he, he'll reuse you know, these sort of motor programs for like a circle across different uh, images, for example, here, 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 um, and so on. So I, I, I'm just... Uh, and if, I'll, I'll describe in more detail, you know, what is the structure of this behavior in a bit, but this is just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Okay. Hey, Lucas, I have a quick question. When you were training the monkey, did, it was, was the monkey trained through some kind of shape, motor shaping? I, I presume you didn't show these stimuli from the beginning, right? Yeah, there are many, there are many stages of shaping, and um, I, we can discuss that uh, either later on or offline if you want, but, but at a very high level, it starts very simple to, to quite complex, yeah. I mean, what I'm getting at is to what extent were, were the certain prim motor primitives implanted by the shaping procedure? Um, to, to a significant extent, yeah. And so part, part of the goal of the shaping procedure was to uh, impose primitive, primitive level structure in the images um, to try and sort of bias what kind of primitives you'll learn. I see. Okay. So there's, not, there's no claim that these primitives are somehow cognitively special. It's just that we gave the animal an alphabet and now you're going to see how it combines those. Or something like it's, that. It's a little more subtle than that because we we might we impose constraints on what kinds of primitives are there, but we don't impose constraints necessarily on let's say the particular motor action he uses to do it. So mm -hmm. he can start from here to here. If he's doing a circle, you see he'll often make like a Q shape, and that's fine. But it's more constraining, kind of loosely, and then having him figure out what are the ways to solve this problem. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And I think that'll be clear on as I discuss more of the control experiments. Um, so I'm glossing over uh, basically the whole training procedure of getting to do this task uh, because I want to get to what I think is, um, at least for the purpose of this talk, like a critical question, to what extent do monkeys learn and generalize uh, compositional structures similar to what we discuss with the humans? Um, so, okay, so that's the next section. And to, to sort of, uh, I, I'll formalize this by, by basically asking three questions. Uh, to what extent do animals learn structure in the form of action primitives? Um, action order and action hierarchy. So action primitives, I mean, single stroke actions that are essentially uh, categories of shapes. Action order, I mean, uh, ways of combining these shapes in a sequential order. Simple examples would be just what direction to do them on the page. And the third is action hierarchy, which um, is a, more, a little more abstract or a little more uh, uh, loosely defined, but in general means ways of sort of chunking uh, a, a longer sequence of actions into essentially, let's say, uh, a multi-level procedure, where in this case, you might uh, draw first the circles and then the lines, or you might first draw lollipops and then a circle, or the top row, then the bottom row or something, right? So you can think of it as, as sort of higher order kinds of action orders. And um, I want to point out that, that conceptually, 
I think of these as sort of um, ingredients within sort of what we call an action grammar. Uh, an action grammar you can think of maybe as, as like a generative model for drawing that um, is flexible enough to generate uh, an almost infinite range of sort of drawings. Um, and you can then think of this, you know, uh, the whole question is really like, you know, can monkeys uh, learn and generalize using these action grammars? Okay. Um, and so first I'll talk about um, action gram grammars varying in the action primitives. So the overall structure of these experiments is similar to with the humans. So you have uh, monkeys trained on either grammar one or grammar two. In this case, uh, these grammars are, are defined by their differences in the primitives that they use. Here, grammar one uses uh, uh, straight lines and bent lines. So I just call this bent lines. Whereas grammar two uses um, only straight lines. And uh, at a high level training uh, of these grammars involves sort of three different methods. One is the visual structure. So just the variation in visual structure the animal sees across images, uh, an order of hundreds of images. Second is a reward. So now the actual reward at the end of each trial is a function not only of the accuracy of the image, but also of the motor sequence that it uses. Uh, so that would, uh, uh, that would reward using grammar one actions for training grammar one and grammar two actions for training grammar two. So a third is moment by moment cues. This is also this is also quite a bit sort of refers to a lot of different things, but it refers to things that um, indicate what sequence of actions to use as animals doing the, the, the trial. For example, there might be sounds that play when the animal is performing the right action or like wrong sounds when the animal does the wrong thing as he's doing it. So ways to sort of almost hold his hand as he's doing the trial. The key point though is that generalization tests uh, never incorporate any um, action-based reward or moment by moment cues. So it's really just how do you generalize to, 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 to sort of a black and white image. Okay. So the, the idea is that after training on these grammars, um, and this takes on the order of hundreds of trials, uh, um, um, <clears throat> sorry, the, the, the question is have animals internalized this sort of uh, grammar? You can test them by just giving them generalization images. And here's an example image. So this image, uh, this is showing that this uh, the monkey, drew this image uh, strikingly differently depending on what he had recently trained on. So after training on grammar one, uh, the, the monkey used this sort of uh, bent line here and sort of two straight lines. Whereas after training on grammar two, the monkey uh, broke this down into five uh, distinct strokes. And a similar idea uh, for the variety of other uh, test images here. And so uh, a few things, I'll, I think there's a couple of key points I really want to emphasize. One is that, um, these images, uh, you can call them extrapolation tasks because they're more complex than the training tasks. The training tasks or training images all uh, were consisting of only uh, three segments, either like an, uh, you know, a bent line and straight line or three straight lines. Whereas the generalization images consist of up, up to five different segments. And they, they can do that even though they've never trained on five segments. And this argues against some sort of rote memorization of just like a sequence of like bent line, and straight line. Second is that this is this reflects one shot generalization. So they have no opportunity to practice any of these test images, um, and they're immediately asked to generalize these images, and they can do that after training on each of these grammars. Um, okay, so what we want to do is come up with quantifying to what extent their their motor behavior, action strategies, is consistent with the grammar they're trained on. To do this, I, I use this, uh, an approach that's quite simple. It's basically just to ask what would a, an optimal drawer under grammar one or under grammar two do to draw a given stimulus. For instance, this image, grammar one uh, would have six permissible trajectories, uh, sort of ways to, to reasonably break this down into um, a bent line and a straight line. Grammar two would have uh, six permissible trajectories, ways to break this down into three distinct lines. And the, the, the question is given a behavioral trial from the monkey, was his behavior more consistent with the, the most similar permissible trajectory from grammar one or from grammar two. In this case, his behavior is much more consistent with grammar one than with grammar two. And so this, now we can compute sort of a motor level distance and I can go to details if you want, but it's a distance that reflects just the motor level, how similar the motor actions are. Uh, and we can uh, summarize these two distances in one index, which I'll call the action primitive index, which is basically uh, an index ranging from negative one to one, where one means uh, your behavior, your motor behavior is more similar to grammar one, Negative one means they're more similar to grammar two. To make that sort of concrete, here are three example trials um, where this top trial is, has a high, more positive action proof index. It's like grammar one. This bottom trial is uh, more like grammar two. You can see the three single lines. 
And this middle trial is sort of somewhere in between, right? Um, it uses three lines, but it kind of looks like grammar one, so it's yeah, somewhere in between. But um, this quantification methods allows us to sort of uh, summarize this behavior to ask to what extent the behavior was consistent with either with grammar one, grammar two. And what we found was that after training on grammar one, behavior was much more consistent with grammar one, uh, grammar one drawer, and vice versa for after training on grammar two. So each of these individual lines is a single um, image, a single problem. Um, uh, and so the, the point is that the exact same stimuli were presented across these two different uh, after these two different training episodes, but the motor behavior was was quite different. So um, so we think this this indicates the subjects in need are learning uh, and generalizing um, action grammars that vary in their action primitives. So what about action order? So we performed an experiment that was structured uh, the same way. So a monkey trains on either grammar one or grammar two. In this case, the grammars vary in the order that things should be done. So that's depicted by, uh, so grammar one uh, should draw objects from left to right. And that's depicted by the color code here of the strokes. Grammar two should draw things from right to left. And so after training, the question is, to what extent have subjects uh, internalized this, this, this rule of, of what direction to draw things? Oh, I, I should also point out one thing is that I, I'm talking about the direction of, a, of, of objects, like line, 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 as opposed to what direction to make each stroke uh, within each stroke. So we found the subjects generalized this, this uh, action order rule. So given, uh, for example, the stimulus right here, this image, uh, the subject drew sort of from left to right, kind of like in this order. Uh, after training on this, uh, this direction grammar, the subject drew from right to left like this. And similar effect across a variety of other different uh, test images. And so again, I want to emphasize uh, a couple of key points is, is one is that these, um, these images are, are, are you, can, you can consider these extrapolation images in that they're different from the test image, the training images. They consist of, the training images were all essentially uh, lines on a row, three lines on a row. And the, the generalization images consisted of uh, up to uh, up to four or five lines, and not necessarily in a row. Some things like compound objects, con like like this. Um, so this indicates again that they, they haven't learned sort of like a very rote sort of um, sequence thing. Um, and, and this is also one shot generalization. Um, and we can quantify this just showing that subjects have a much higher probability of doing right to left to right or right to left, depending on what they're trained on, condition the exact same image. So. Right, um, just check the time. Okay, so, so it looks like subjects are, are learning action order. What about action hierarchy? So uh, concretely, what I mean by action hierarchy is that if you're given an image like this, most people will, will, will draw this in a way that's, um, uh, let's say follows one of these hierarchical structures. Uh, so for example, you might draw circles or lines, and you can represent that by the sort of parse tree where you have a, a chunk for circles, chunk for lines. You might draw lines to circles. Um, or you might draw lollipops where you combine lines of circles that are close to each other into, into lollipops. And I just want to sort of, again, reference back to human work where you can think of the human work as, as one form of sort of hierarchy in which different groups learned either sort of this hierarchy involving vertical skewer chunks or hierarchies involving uh, lollipops and dumbbells. So can monkeys learn something like this? So, so first we, we, we train subjects just to combine lines of circles in sort of arbitrary uh, orders in space. Um, and so after training, we had subjects were able to sort of to draw line circles in, in quite an arbitrary fashion. For example, uh, these generalization images here. The few things I want to point, and there's one thing I want to point out, which is that this subject, again, uh, has this sort of like um, Q or question mark kind of uh, circle. And I want to point out that it's, it's not super critical for me that they, they're making visually accurate images, but it's the interesting thing is about sort of this compositionality of these consistent motor programs that they use to do circles, regardless of what sort of context it's in, like what positions in space or what sequential order it's used in with relation to the other uh, primitives. Um, so, um, okay, so, so after subjects have learned just to use lines of circles, we can test whether they can, they've learned these, they can learn action hierarchies. So the way that worked is again, similar experimental structure. In this case, there are uh, three different grammars they're trained on. And then one baseline. Baseline is just what they were doing after training on lines and circles, without any um, in, uh, instruction for what uh, how to order them. 
So uh, we train on lines to circle, circles to lines, lines to circles, and lollipops. And so here's an example of, of generalization uh, to two different test stimuli. I chose the second test stimulus on purpose because it's, um, it emphasizes that the test stimuli, again, uh, consisted of not just two lines of circles, but up to three uh, lines of circles. And, and so all the training images had at most two circles or lines, but in different places in space. So baseline, this subject um, liked to sort of do circles and lines starting from bottom left to top right. You can see that in the color code here from blue to green. So after training the circles and lines, this subject li liked to sort of go, as this subject then showed a bias to do the circles first. And you can see circle, circle here, or in this case, circle, 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 and then like line, line, line. And this, after training lines to circles, the subject had a bias for lines to circles. Um, so here, like line, line, circles, and like one W shape, uh, line, line, and then like uh, circle, 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 and combining this line circle here, um, which is kind of interesting and cool, actually. Um, and then after lollipops, the subject can put together these um, uh, adjacent lines and circles into lollipop-like things. You know, it, it's not like a perfectly clean lollipop like the humans, but um, um, you know, it, clearly they've, they've learned some sort of structure there. And so we, to quantify this, uh, we can again ask this very similar question is, is your motor behavior similar to what an, a, an ideal lollipop drawer would do, for example? So uh, this, is, this plot here is just showing for this specific trial, this one trial, how consistent this motor behavior is to how a lollipop drawer would do it, a lines of circles drawer, or a circles of lines drawer would do it. And the y-axis I'm plotting just motor similarity. Um, and on the x-axis is different optimal drawers. What this is showing is that on this trial, this behavior was more similar to a lollipop drawer than to the other two models drawers. And we can summarize um, this, uh, this, this, this by, by computing what I'm calling an alignment index, which is simply to what extent is your behavior on your trial more consistent with the grammar that you're being trained on compared to the other grammars? Uh, where zero is similar, one is more similar to your trained grammar. And so this had an, a trial had an alignment index of 0 0.38. You can make a similar plot for the other three trials here. In all cases, the alignment index was greater than one. Uh, on this top trial, you can see that uh, the circles during, after training on circles of lines, this subject's behavior was more similar to circles of line model. After training on lines to circle, this subject's behavior was more similar to lines to circle. Interestingly, you can see that it's also quite similar to the lollipop drawer, and you can see why that's the case, is that you know, this, this line and this circle are actually done in temporal proximity, which is something that a lollipop drawer might do. Right? Um, but to, now we want to sort of summarize across you know, all, all, all these trained grammars and all uh, images, not just, uh, not just this task. And that's what I'm plotting here. So what I'm plotting is that, that essentially the population across all uh, test problems, test images, the average alignment index. So each dot here is a single test image. Uh, and um, uh, this is showing basically that, for instance, the circles, so after training on circles of lines, subjects uh, almost always uh, drew their uh, drawings more consistent with the circles of lines model than the other models. Um, and uh, similarly, for the, after training on these other um, grammars. Um, and I, again, I want to point out these are each test image contributes one data point to all of these. So the, the stimuli are the same, it's just the motor behavior is different. I, th I think this result uh, suggests that, you know, behavior is consistent with learning some aspect of these hierarchical strategies. Um, and, you know, extrapolation argues against rote memorization. Uh, a key question is how abstract um, is this hierarchical, hierarchical knowledge? So what do I mean by that? So, so if we go back to this, um, uh, the, the human stuff here, um, there's reason to believe that, you know, humans learn something quite abstract, which is like a skewer, uh, abstract function that can take in sort of any sorts of primitives and put them in the correct place on the skewer, like, you know, line, circle, 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 circle on a skewer, or even a line and nothing and a, and a circle at the bottom. It's possible that the monkeys have learned something uh, analogously abstract. So they might have learned, let's say, a repeat function, which um, let's say can take in one primitive line or circle. Uh, and, and some number, like two, and will generate something like repeat two circles, repeat three circles, or uh, repeat a line twice. Alternatively, the monkeys might have learned something maybe a little less abstract, but, but more uh, but still hierarchical. 
and that they might have learned particular chunks, like three circles, two circles, and so on, but still abstracting that they can put these circles down in any location in the page, for example. And um, I, th I think, so, so an, an ongoing work we're trying to think about how to sort of differentiate uh, between these kinds of uh, hierarchical structure, um, both in terms of testable behavioral predictions as, as well as uh, testable neural predictions. But either way, I think it, it, it's, um, I think this is a very cool result um, that, that monkeys are doing something that looks like hierarchical structure in, in this sort of task. Um, so, um, so, so I, I think if, I, I've, I've tried to convince you that uh, monkeys not only can learn to trace and draw in this task, but they can do in a manner that uh, reflects compositional structure and how they generalize. Um, and so I wanna take this time to sort of maybe just uh, outline what I think are maybe some interesting conclusions based on the behavior. Uh, first is just that I think it's pretty cool that monkeys can draw in a simple way. Uh, what how this is I, I don't think this is drawing in the sense like the way an artist or, or a human might, might draw, but I think it reflects some of these sort of compositional um, uh, action and perceptual strategies involved in drawing. Um, and you know a speculation, you know maybe it, it reflects uh, some innate compositional engine. Uh, that, that, that monkeys naturally have for visual construction or for action planning. Um, and then we're sort of tapping into it in this task. So uh, I, I'd say, I, I think it's also interesting that in, um, in, in this comparison between humans and monkey compositionality, to the extent that humans and monkeys, humans and monkeys in this task showed some similarity uh, in, in sort of, the, you know, the presence of hierarchical structure and so on, although I think humans were, were I don't think the monkeys uh, can, can draw nearly as, as complex things as humans, obviously. But I think um, in ongoing work, ongoing work, I'm interested in thinking about the possibility of, of, um, of studying how they generalize, how monkeys are generalized, how monkeys and humans generalize, to, to ask the question of, is there a shared compositional engine across primate brains, humans and monkey brains? Um, and this is something I'd love to talk or think about. Um, so from a neuroscience perspective, this sets the stage for, uh, for potentially the mechanistic study of compositionality. Uh, and I also want to point out just that, you know, monkeys are still progressively gaining expertise uh, as I'm training them on more task variations and of tasks of increasing complexity. So um, now I'd like to briefly discuss uh, ongoing work and plans towards um, identifying neural mechanisms. So, you know, we have a behavioral paradigm, cross-species paradigm, and we have some indication of the, the symbol like cognitive algorithms that might be involved. How do we get to neural, neural mechanisms? So first we're gonna record neural data uh, and we're planning to uh, record uh, from large populations of neurons across multiple parts, multiple areas in monkey cortex uh, by implanting electrode arrays across multiple areas of cortex. And we're targeting, in our, in our first animal, we're targeting areas in, in frontal, premotor and motor areas that have been implicated in planning inference, um, other aspects of high-level cognition. Um, but in future work, I'd love to record also from um, visual areas and other parts of the brain. The goal is to record from an order of hundreds of neurons um, as animals are doing this task. So let's say we have neural data, uh, where do we go from there? So uh, in, we're taking two complementary approaches. One approach is what you might call sort of a top-down approach based on the idea that, that neural activity uh, is explicitly representing and computing in a way uh, 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 using uh, these symbol-like algorithms that we, um, that we model in the behavior. Uh, in other words, there might be representations of action primitives, action order, and hierarchy, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so to make this more concrete, consider this like this sketch. Um, so you have a brain here um, seeing an image um, and it's generating movements and there's you know, visual feedback and feedback, internal feedback about the movement and so on. And there's all these internal representations and, and, and dynamics happening in here. So we can speculate about what that might look like internally. So um, this, is, this is a bit busy. So I want to walk you through maybe just a few interesting points uh, that I th things I find interesting. One is the possibility of, of what you might call like factorized representations of these different symbolic components. So in one population uh, or area, there might be representations of, 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 of parts of these images, such as um, what shapes are present, where are those shapes, um, features of those shapes, like the orientation, their size, and so on. At the other end, there might be maybe motor cortex, there might be sort of a library of motor primitives. Um, sort of like almost like hard-coded representations of how to do a circle, how to do a line, like categories of movements. 
in here, what I'm plotting is uh, these three axes represent three axes in uh, a neural state space. And this represents how activity might progress in a stereotypical manner to, to produce the actions that underlie circle. And so this might be like a library of, of primitives. And in between, there's a lot of, potentially might be a lot of interesting things going on in terms of representations of prior knowledge and representations of ongoing plans. Here I'm representing, for example, the idea that there might be abstract representations of like action primitive categories, like lines and circles um, as like sort of a, a, a direction in state space and like more abstract uh, more, uh, or variables represented to the hierarchical structure of action plans, such as how many strokes are present and other sort of hierarchical, hierarchically structured, other, other sequence uh, related um, variables. And this, this, and this black line represents how it might progress uh, during the course of a trial in a dynamic fashion at, at each stroke. So given this overall sketch, I think maybe it's worth just emphasizing maybe a few interesting questions. One is to what extent might, the, I mean, assuming something like this might be present, to, to what extent is there modularity, right? Are these separate parts of the brain or are these like distributed across the brain, but reflect in a different way in terms of uh, population, uh, separations in population space? Second, I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting points is what is the nature of dynamic interactions between these percepts, priors, plans, movement of feedback, right? This is a, a highly dynamic task in which symbolic elements are not statically present, but they're driving action and updating based on the ongoing action. For example, there might be, in the plan, there might be representation of, I need to do circle, circle, line, and the circle representation might be triggering, for instance, a motor program for circle here, then getting feedback that says, I'm done with the circle, now move on to the next uh, symbol, uh, and so on. There's a possibility of, of mental simulation or planning. Um, is there any evidence of sort of covert dynamics that, that reflect planning and simulation? Fourth, uh, monkeys have to decide when to stop. So is there some internal representation or decision process for saying, now I'm, my drawing is good enough? Some representation of confidence, for example. Uh, and so these are just sort of some, some thoughts on, on maybe some directions um, we might go with sort of this top-down approach. And, and, and concurrently, um, I'm also, we, we are uh, taking sort of, you might call a biologically driven approach where uh, we build neural network models uh, with the goal of, uh, not constraining these models to represent any sort of um, uh, cognitive symbols, but to simply try to capture the neural activity and the behavior. The idea being that given the right sort of constraints in these models in terms of the ar architecture or objective functions and with sufficient biological plausibility of these constraints that the, the network might discover mechanisms that um, are, can act as sort of hypotheses for what the brain might be doing. Um, and so in, in this work, I won't show you any of this work, but but we in ongoing work with uh, collaborating with with, uh, with members of Xiaojing Wang's lab, I've been developing uh, neural network models, and and I think there's some interesting stuff here um, that uh, I won't have time to discuss, but um, yeah, there's some promising early work here. Anyways, um, so the ultimate goal is to try and sort of reconcile these uh, different levels of analyses in, in some sort of some sort of sort of general explanatory model. And so that, that's basically um, the content of the talk. And I, if, if you allow me just uh, a minute, I'd like to sort of just summarize everything and, and sort of uh, summarize the key points. Um, so, so I start out by asking, um, what are mechanisms of compositionality? And I argued that it, it would be very useful to have a sort of uh, cross-level paradigm that allows us to get at sort of neurobiological mechanisms um, at, at, and, and cross-level paradigm across behavior, cognition, and, and neurons. And uh, I'd argue we developed um, a paradigm that, that, that seems to allow us to do that um, uh, by studying drawing across humans and monkeys. A study of, study of their behavior indicates that uh, the capacity for both monkeys and uh, humans to, to, to learn uh, after compositional structures that allow them to generalize when they draw. So generalization of action grounds. And I think um, the, the behavioral findings I think are interesting. For one, it, it indicates potentially um, a, 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 a capacity for monkeys for abstract compositional um, action planning that has, has not really been, I think, fully deeply explored much in, in prior work. Um, second is uh, the, the comparison of monkey and, and human uh, behaviors suggests, or, or I think maybe sets the stage for potentially asking about the, the, the presence of sort of core compositional engine for visual motor construction um, across primates, which 
might be interesting for various reasons, including, for instance, evolutionary uh, questions about how, how the mind evolved. Um, in ongoing work, we're, we're pushing towards getting at uh, uh, neural mechanisms by doing uh, both neural network modeling and preparing uh, neural recordings. And the goal is to eventually uh, combine all these different data sets to, to come up with sort of a general explanatory framework for how compositionality works at the level of um, across behavior, cognitive symbols, and, and neurons. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, th thank um, really the, a lot of important people in this project, uh, in particular, Vinrik, um, who's been my main advisor uh, at Rockefeller, uh, has been really instrumental for getting uh, a lot of this stuff working. Um, and I also want to thank Josh and Xiao Jing. Um, and I also want to uh, thank uh, people uh, in, in the labs who have collaborated on, on aspects of this project, including Marta and Kevin, who have collaborated with on uh, the human work, and Vishwa in, in uh, Xiao Jing's lab, who I'm collaborating with on, on neural network modeling. I also want to thank uh, various sources of funding. Uh, I want to thank uh, the participants, uh, especially these guys. They, they work very hard. Um, uh, the humans as well, obviously. And, um, and I want to thank you for your time, and, and I'd be happy to take any questions or any discussion points. Uh, thank you.